to greet all of you tonight in the name of Christ, welcoming those who will join us by live stream also. This will be our 33rd lesson in the exposition of the book of Amos. From some points of view, this uh, is a very strong book. It's fairly representative of a number of, a number of prophets in the uh, in the scriptures. No. No. We are being exposed to God and how God uh, deals with repeated. Re repetitive and uh, expressions of sin. The modern church doesn't really know how to handle sin. This is a very uh, deep concern to myself. They tend to gloss it over and treat it as though it's not that serious. But you can tell by the tone of Amos that this is not this is not a fair representation of God. There are certain things that God looks for and expects in men, uh, mankind. By men, I say men, mankind. All men, whether they're saved or not, there are certain things He looks for and expects in them, and when they're not found. He acts upon the, that finding. But he's especially this way about people that are affiliated with his name. It's especially. Uh, <coughs> this is something that institutionalism covers up. When Christianity became institutionalized, by institutionalized I mean an organization superseded God himself. See, most church people really aren't interested in God at all. It sounds kind of a broad statement, but it's an organization that has captured their attention, and that has successfully hid the nature of God so that God, uh, God is not seen. And understanding that eternal life is knowing God, that, that's a very serious matter. See, people are trying to measure up to institutional standards for some people, they're very high because they were down really low. But they're not to be compared with what God expects. We're going to touch on some of this tonight. There comes a time when heaven just intrudes into society. When God imposes himself into society and does something about certain things. Uh, the news media won't, won't recognize it as the work of God, but if you have an eye for it and an understanding, you can see God's, God's bringing some things down. Amen. Amen. And he presses people to what he expects out of them, whether they're Christian or not. There's things God expects. And he'll act if they're not there. And in the old times, whether they were Jews or not, or whether they were in a covenant with God or not, if they were Assyria or Babylonia or whatever, some of these other heathen countries, God expected certain conduct out of the people. He expected certain manners in the governors. And when he didn't find it, he spoke up about it Amen. and did, uh, did something about it. When John the Baptist came, see, he dealt with what was going on. He dealt with the condition of society. Even in modest soldiers, you remember. He brought up, he, John the Baptist came when sin had been covered up for about five centuries. About 500 years had all been covered up since Malachi. The scribes and Pharisees, oh, they had a thriving system of religion. Boy, they, they had big wigs galore. And looked highly successful. And even kings and governors were concerned about keeping the Jews in their religion in a, in, a, in a state of acceptance. But wherever there's ever been 
a spiritual awakening of any kind, it's always preceded by an acute awareness of sin. Re Revival has never been instituted because poverty was dominant, to my knowledge. I'll, 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 I'll say to my knowledge. To my knowledge, where there has been like universal poverty and storms and things like this, that's never been a prelude to a revival, so far as I know. Revival has always been preceded by an acute awareness of sin. And where there's not an acute awareness of sin, there will not be revival. There just may be religious pretension, but there will not be revival. Now this is seen in the great judgments of the Lord that are chronicled by Amos. See, he's producing an awareness of sin. He's telling people why he did this. You did this, I did that. I did this because you did that. You may think I don't react to the kind of life you've lived down there, but I do. It's a very hard thing to bear. Uh, we're summoned forth by the sin of the people. Isaiah said, it was a, it's a lament, said with tears, something God said. It's found in uh, Ezekiel 9.9, 9, the ox knows his owner, the ass his master's crib, the donkey knows where to go when it's time to go to sleep. And when it's time to eat, a jackass knows where to go. But Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. See, that's how bad. <laughs> the brute beast had more sense than the people were in God's name. Well, that's the kind of situation we're involved in in, in the book of Amos. These are the, our text tonight is the, is the last... Uh, verses of chapter 5 beginning with verse 24 but let judgment run down his waters and righteousness is a mighty stream have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years O house of Israel but ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Sion your images the star of your God, which he made to yourselves. Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Hmm. And we're going to find out quite a bit about Israel here tonight and things that went on, what God expects. Let judgment run down his waters. <clears throat> And righteousness is a mighty stream. Now God's going to tell the people what he expects of them. When he says let, he expects this to happen. What he says, he expects this to happen. Let judgment run down his waters and righteousness is a mighty stream. This is not just a suggestion. This is not like a goal to set. Their condition was not acceptable. And it wasn't going to be until this happened. There had been sufficient time elapsed for them to make some progress. God had sent prophets to them early, the scripture says. Had plenty of time for them to repent and make amends. Yet God says, they have turned unto me the back. They turn their back. I came to them. I faced them. And they turn their backs to me. Oh, so there's people have done this. They showed me their back. And not the face. Though I taught them rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. So see, is it innocent? No. What do you want us to do, Lord? Let judgment run down like waters. 
some alternate translations that let justice run down like waters. Let justice roll on like a river. Let the right go rolling on. Let justice will up like water. Let justice surge like waters. Justice must flow like torrents of water. And I want to see a mighty flood of justice. Start doing what's right. Start making right assessments. Stop making wrong assessments. Yes, Judah. You just mentioned this text that says that Israel turned their backs to God. I thought of the text that says if God be for us, who can be against us. But if God be against you, then who can possibly be for you yeah. and be a benefit to you? But a person who shows God their back, God will do the same to them. Yeah, see, showing God your back, that's refusing to face him. On a, on, a pra on a practical basis, all right, that would be a, a felt person sitting there and, a, and a, a sermon or something is going out that, that's hitting pretty hard and they get up and go home. They showed God their back. That's what they did. Showed them their back. Let waters run down like justice. Now there's different views of this text, as you might explain. Suppose some believe this is the judgment God's about to exact himself. I don't think that's what it means myself. Others think it's a prophecy of the judgment against sin that's going to take place in Christ came. I I don't think that's either. I think that geez, that's <laughs> that's bad exposition. This is what God expects out of Israel. It's best for them to prepare for his judge, for his judgment. He's already told them, I'm, I'm coming down. You've sinned three transgressions, four transgressions. You've crossed the line of demarcation. There's no way you can avoid what I'm going to do. The hammer's coming down. But if you don't do what I tell you to do, it's going to be worse than you dared to imagine. You've got to prepare for it with right things, right judgment. See, they'd been exercised in wrong judgment. The priests and the judges were oppressing the poor. They were overtaxing the poor. They were building castles for themselves from the monies they took from the poor. It wasn't just righteous. Do you think of all the unjust judgments that have happened? Wrong people that have been condemned. Wrong people that have been judged. Wrong people been kicked out. Wrong people accepted. How much of that has happened? That was happening in Israel. And God noted it. It's not right. You haven't done what's right. And now you've got to start now doing what's right. Judgment's got to come up like a swelling flood. This is not something that can be done gradually. This is not a program you set in motion and work your way toward right judgments. It's got to start today, tonight. Amen. Just as John the Baptist was that way, he told people, you got to repent. You can't do it not tomorrow. you got to repent now. Yes. you got to stop doing what you're doing now. Yes. You have to start doing what's right now. Yes. That's judgment breaking forth. As waters, yes. Temptation from Satan to keep putting it off. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> now this is a revelation of the divine nature. God is holy, and God is loving, but God's demanding. Amen. When He says repent, brother, that that better be what happens. When He says come to Me. You, you better be running. Yes, amen. Come to him. When he says, stop making wrong assessments. Stop loving the world. Stop caving in all the time to the pressures of people. Uh -huh. Stop trying to please people. See, this is judgment springing amen. forth. You remember that when uh, a fornicator was found in Corinth, they had to do something about it right off, right now. Yeah. You right now get together, right now, mm -hmm. 
and you commit this person to the devil. Yeah. Cut loose from him. Cut loose. You don't have anything to do with him. Mm-hmm. He's going to get out here in the wilderness, and God then will be the only one that can deal with him. Yeah. There are some people, mm-hmm. this happens. Yes. No one wants it to happen, but this, is, this, is, this happens. So mm-hmm. You get to the point, no, no Christian can help you. Yeah. No church can help you. Be that far gone, but God, God, God could get the work done. Amen. And it's always on an immediate yes. type basis. See, this kind of thing would it would soften the judgment coming upon them. At least they'd be aware of God and conscious of God while the thing is going on. Revelation of the divine nature when the people of the day of Pentecost. They were convicted, pricked in their hearts, and said, what shall we do? Peter didn't say, go home and think about this. Think over what I've said. We're not trying to push anybody, not trying to, I'm trying to push somebody. I'm done with this kind of religion that says, don't force the people. Force them. Push them. Make them think about it. Like God did. Make them think about it. Don't, get, don't let up. Their soul's at stake. Amen. Amen. We're talking about heaven or hell here. Uh-huh. We're not talking just about pleasing people. Amen. Peter said to them, this is what you got to do. Repent and be baptized. Uh-huh. They had to do it that day. Yes. This wasn't something to do the next day. They did it that day. Many gladly received the word or baptized. 3,000 folk were added. Boy, there was great joy among the people. And God, a great release happened. They are free from their sin. They were one with one another. Just solved a whole lot of things. But if they'd have lingered, nothing would have been solved. Judgment broke forth. See, when God offers salvation to somebody, it's like an open door. It's an honest, uh-huh. it's an honest offer, but yes. you got to act on it. Amen. And if you do, whatever strength you lack, God will s- supply. That's how, that's how it works. And at the point you exert yourself, then you get the strength to pick up your bed and walk, so Amen. to speak. Right. When you, you make your way to the pool of Siloam, and you're blind, and you got mud on your eye, how are you going to get there? Well, you figure out a way to do it. Yeah. And when he washed his eyes, eh, he was, he came seeing, but he had to do it then. He couldn't he couldn't go home and sleep with mud on his eye. He had to do it then. Because this is the kind of salvation that's satisfying. That's right. This is the kind. It would, imagine if you had to wait two or three weeks to get it. See how disappointing that would be. Oh, yeah. Right now, if you respond to God right now, you'll get the answer. Yeah. This this is the secret. Now this is the secret. You can't make somebody else do this. You only can work on it yourself. The other, everybody else, they have, to, they have to do their own work on it. But when you do this and when you're convicted or something comes to you and you know there's a change to be made, you know i got to rethink this thing, I, and you do it right away, God will never let you down. Amen. You'll never fail. That's right. You will never fail. As to your faith, you will, God will enable you to do it. To let judgment, see the nominal church, nominal means by name only. The nominal church is plagued with unsound judgments. It's in every church, in every religious institution, every charitable institution, every what they call parachurch organization has got a something lousy in their background. This is just, we wish it wasn't this way, but this is just the way it is. Bad judgments, bad assessments, flawed assessments. God says, that's got to stop. Were the Israel there? you got to stop making it hard on the poor. This is tough has got to stop. you got to stop taxing the poor and building your nice fancy mansions with what you get. You got to stop treading on them, the disadvantaged people. You got to stop that. That's that's bad judgment. 
So let the judgment run down like waters. It's like a, all of a sudden, like a flood waters. And righteousness is a mighty stream. <laughs> Upright lives. I've read some of revivals in the last hundred years, uh, revivals that took place. There were sudden changes. The uh, Welsh revival was in the 1920s, so it's a fairly recent vintage. And they said it was the uh, coal mining area, and they said the donkeys in the coal mines knew the people had been converted because they weren't mean to them anymore. <laughs> yeah. Police stations were, there was no such thing as police. They didn't have police or police stations. Became obsolete. What happened? Righteousness broke out like a mighty stream. Yeah. <laughs> Either Jews didn't have to have jails after Pentecost. Uh -huh. Huh? Not then. Righteous is brought forth like a mighty stream. Their ungodly ways were abandoned. It is possible for a person to abandon their ungodly ways on an immediate basis. And then they'll, they'll have to fight the good fight of faith. I, mean, I understand that, but it's possible to just abandon them, right? That's what, that's what God's talking about. Now, you know yourself that the presence of tolerance of unrighteous manners is phenomenal among professing Christians. And some people encourage us to be tolerant of ungodly living, but this is not what God says. He says, I want to see righteousness like a mighty river, mighty stream break out. Our efforts now they're not to be crude and thoughtless, understand. We're, we're not to be crude and thoughtless in our passing this on to people, but it's got to affect you like it affected Jeremiah. Here's what he said. He saw Jerusalem. He saw it going down the tube. He saw what God is going to do. God's going to forsake him. He's going to give him up to Babylonian captivity, and Jeremiah saw this. And, you know, the whole book of Lamentations is a lament over this situation, but here's what he said in Jeremiah 9, one. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. No matter how much I cry, Jeremiah said, it seems like it's not enough. I just think I ought to be more sad about this situation than I am. Maybe you felt that way. You kind of see the condition of the church. Sometimes it makes you mad, you know. But sometimes you say, you know, I ought to be more sad about this situation. I ought to weep more in my prayers about this. It's that bad. What it, when a person does do that, what is that? That's righteousness breaking forth like a stream. That's what that is. Not only does the person who's caught up in sin declare a renunciation of it, but the person who sees the need, they say, they say what they can say, but listen, this is a heart-rending situation. Amen. You see, people, their lives are going down the tube. Uh -huh. You said what you could, you've done what you could, and it doesn't, it just it breaks your heart to see it because you know what the outcome is. Yeah. And maybe you've been down the road yourself. You remember what? <laughs> it wasn't all that easy to recover. It could be done quickly, but not easily. Amen. So let uh, judgment run down like waters and righteousness is a mighty stream. Now we're going to learn something else about God here. God's going to bring up something that happened centuries before Amos wrote. He's going to go back to that 40 years that Israel wandered in the wilderness. Hmm? That was a long time before this. Long time before this. Centuries before this. He's going to go back. Have ye offered unto me sacrifice and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, whole house of Israel? God now confirms through Amos 
that Israel had departed from God from the very beginning. Yeah. And they never had corrected the situation. We already know at the foot of Mount Sinai they had this golden calf made, bowed down, danced around it, got drunk, committed fornication, the scripture says, eh? at the foot of Mount Sinai. Yeah. Less than, a, less than four, 40 days after they had been scared to death at the presence of God, this is what they were doing. And their hearts remained hard. That's the point he's going to say. They're, they never did recover. Even 3,000 people died because of that. They never recovered from that Mount Sinai blunder. And he's going to show you that that was the case. Their hearts remain hard. I said, now did I, did you offer, we might say, did you really offer to me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness those 40 years? But what were you doing now Moses was with them all 40 years. He led them. It was a hard uh, ministry for him, but Aaron was with them a good part of the time. Miriam was with them a good part of the time. Joshua and Caleb were with them all the entire time. Those 40 years. See, all the men 20 years and upward died during that 40 years. How many men was it? 603,551, well over half a million. Yeah. 40 years, they died in that 40 years because they refused to believe they could go in and possess the land. Amen. That was their sin. Mm -hmm. Yet during the wilderness, they, made, they kept up a religious appearance, but it wasn't consistent. For instance, they didn't practice circumcision. Yeah. During that entire time, nobody was circumcised. It could have been because a person, they, and they didn't keep the Passover. Probably because the Passover wouldn't let an uncircumcised person keep the Passover. If you were uncircumcised, you couldn't keep the Passover. So during these 40 years, they didn't circumcise. They didn't keep the Passover. And Joshua told them afterward when they were on the ready to enter Canaan, he said, put away the strange gods <laughs> that they'd had when they were in the, in the wilderness. They, they were worshiping other gods when they were being punished for their sin. You wonder how hard sin can make you? That's how hard it can make you. God can hammer you real hard because you're sinning. You just tote false gods around and worship them and offer sacrifices to them pretending like you're offering them to God. Moses, before Moses died, he said they already had gone a whoring after other gods. This is during the wilderness. So can really hard discipline change a person's heart? No. No, I can't. You can make them miserable. We understand that. Can't change their heart. He's showing you this. The Israelites left off offering proper sacrifices. Did you offer me sacrifices? In other words, what God is saying, whatever you did there, I didn't recognize it as being offered to me. Forty years of punishment in the wilderness with Moses leading them. And a lot of miracles taking place, miraculous food and water all through those 40 years. And yet they continued in their stubborn ways. It's kind of un <laughs> unbelievable, isn't it? When you think about it, it's kind of, that's, that's what sin does to somebody. That's what it does. If you've ever been overcome by sin after you were in Christ, now I was thinking when I was. It wasn't because salvation is weak. It's just I started palling with the wrong people. That's what it boiled down to. And it's amazing how hard you can get. 
while you're being punished. <laughs> this entire wilderness experience confirms the essentiality of the new birth. See, it confirms why you have to have a new heart. This was a chosen people, a blessed people, a delivered people, a led people, miraculously fed people, and yet during their chasing, they didn't repent. And he goes on and mentions something. The Exodus record doesn't mention this. You carried the tabernacle of Molech and, and Shion with you. Some of the other versions read, you carried Sikoth, that's the transliteration of the Hebrew word, and she and your idols. This is it. Now, man, this is in the will. This is during the 40 years. You have lifted up the shrine of your king, the pedestal of your idols. You carried along the statues of the god Sikoth as your king. And no, but instead of bringing me the appointed sacrifices, you carried about the tent of your king Sikoth and Kaiwan names the gods, names for the gods of the planet Saturn. <laughs> so you what is God merciful? He fed these people. While they're toting about yeah. tents to false gods. They should have been carrying, like carrying the Ark of the Covenant out in front. Maybe they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant out in front. But somewhere in their procession they had some tents they're toting along for their false gods during those 40 years. Now I find the attempt to grasp why these various translations read so different. It's annoying to me. I, I discipline myself to read the other versions because I have. A, it makes me more firm in my opposition to them. And I wonder why they read so different. So I said, "Well, I'm I'm going to let someone who knew the truth interpret it for me." And Stephen referred to this text. Stephen quoted the text we're reading right now. Stephen quoted it to the Sanhedrin. So I'm interested <laughs> in how he viewed this. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the work of their hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. God said, you don't want... You don't want to worship me? You don't want to serve me? I'm going to make it so you'll serve others. You're going to serve somebody. Yes, amen. I'm not going to let you not serve anybody. I made man to serve. Yeah. And you don't serve me, I'll pick out who you serve. Yes. And then I'll condemn you for doing it. Mm -hmm. That's God. We're talking about God now. <coughs> God gave them up to worship the host of heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets and then he quotes our text O house of Israel have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness yea ye took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your God Rimphan figures which ye made to worship them he so I said Stephen I'm going to take your I'm going to take your word on this. I'm not going to use these other translations yes. of the words they use. I'm going to, I'm going to take what you said. Amen. Amen. You spoke by the Holy Spirit. Yes. <clears throat> he said, now God said, I'm going to carry you away. Our text says to Damascus. Stephen said to Babylon. Mm -hmm. And this is covered in the next verse. You made images to the star of your God. That is, they, they started worshiping the heavenly bodies, which the law strictly forbade. And God told them, "Now, be, when you go to the when you go to the land of Canaan, there's other nations in there, and they worship false gods. And be careful now; you don't get caught up in doing what they do." Well, you got to see this, brother. That. Yeah. When people come to Christ, you got you can't hobnob with the world. Amen. Amen. 
They don't worship the God you worship. Yeah, right. If they say they do, they just lied. That's all. It's not the truth. Here's what, here's what God said to them. <coughs> Unless thou lift up thine eyes into heaven, and when thou seest the sun, the moon, and the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, shouldst be driven to worship them and serve them. This is, this is, what a, this is before they entered into Canaan, Moses told them this. Watch out. We've got, what do you think the Zodiac is? That's right. Mm -hmm. What do you think the daily horoscope is? Yeah, that's right. When you go to some restaurants, they'll have all the, what sign were you born under? What do you think that is? Yeah. They're worshiping the stars. Yeah. Yeah. It's idolatry. And some people read their horoscope in the paper like it meant something. Mm -hmm. Is it innocent? No, it's not innocent. No. Any more than it was for these people here to say, well, it's pretty good. I was born under the sign of blah, blah. And why well, I've noticed I'm that kind of person, just like it says there. They lean across the table and say to their wife, what does your sign say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It all sounds innocent. It's not innocent. There's demons involved here. Amen. So the gods they are worshiping were heaven, they were heavenly mm -hmm. bodies. That's what they were. Star God. <coughs> they walked, but the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. This is Ezekiel. See, now remember the wilderness. This is a long time before Ezekiel. But they rebelled against me in the wilderness they walk not in my statutes they despise my judgments which if a man do he shall even live in them in my sabbaths they greatly polluted they didn't even keep the sabbath holy during those 40 years mm -hmm. then I said I'll pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness so they got plagues sometimes snakes bit them sometimes poison water got them all kind of things happen in the wilderness why because they were worshiping other gods while they were being chastised by God in the wilderness. <coughs> Starve your God. In Judges, the second chapter, verse 11 to 13, it's, it's written that after the death of Joshua now, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of God and served Balaam, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, and the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger, and they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Astra. That's as soon as Joshua died, they just went into it with all their heart. So Amos has shown, see, that Israel's always been a deficient people. They've always been wayward. It, you, can't, you can't train the flesh to be godly. Amen. You can't bring the hammer down on the flesh and make life miserable and change the person by that means. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can make them miserable. God sure knows how to make them miserable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really what, you're, what you're saying here is why grace and truth had to come by Jesus Christ and not by the law. Yeah. The law was... The law was given to show sin, and in the law, it was specifically stated, don't make an agreement with these other nations, because God God knew they would. And God knew once they were around them, yeah. they would, the other nations would, be, would influence Israel, and they would be given yeah. over. Either, maybe you've heard people say this. I have. We all need to make more friends of sinners so we can convert them. Well, someone will be converted, but it won't be you. That's right. yep. This is not the method God uses. Amen. God uses the preaching of the gospel yep. to save Amen. people. The power of God unto salvation is the gospel of Jesus Christ, not friendship. Yes. Amen. That doesn't mean you have to be mean and unpolite yep. and all that. That's not what we're saying. Uh -huh. <coughs> so Amos has shown us that they... They're, the 
Society of Amos Day was grouped with a bunch that worshipped idols at the foot of Sinai and that served other gods during the 40 years. He bunched them together. Yeah, Jesus did the same thing. He, told, he said, you're the same generation as the ones that killed the prophets. You're all one generation. Yes? There's teachings out there today that, uh, that say to let God have control of your life and things like that. But from this very thing that you're teaching us tonight, mm -hmm. God has never lost control of anything. No. He's in total control. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yielding is a, it's yielding. Uh -huh. Amen. Yeah. It is that God's going to make it work out no matter what. You just you just got to live the way you want to live and it'll all pan out. We have the pan out theology. It'll all pan out in the end. But, oh, that's, that's not how God does have control. But the control is against you if you don't yield to it. Worshiping gods of their own making in the wilderness. And here now we're centuries, this is centuries later and God brings this up and these people are even a different generation of people. They're like eight or nine generations from that time. But they're the same kind of people. There's some people today, you got to talk to them like God talked to Cain. Yeah, amen. They're that kind of people. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. There's a generation of ungodly people that don't call on the name of the Lord. They may have lived a thousand years, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand years ago, or they may have lived last week, but they're the same generation, yet talk to them the same way. Amen. <laughs> Therefore, God says, because of this, that you kept on, instead of this stuff being eliminated, from the Jews, they kept on growing. So, I'll cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. I say, I'll cause, I'll cause this to happen. Yeah. Now, let me tell you that if I'll just transfer to myself, myself, if when I was wandering from the Lord, someone had come and told me that God's gonna told me what God's going to do. I'd figure, I figure I could, I could find a way out of this. Yeah. I think I could work my way out of this. No, you can't work your way out. When God makes a determination, you can't work your way out of it. Amen. God tells the people what to do here. That's not going to relieve them from the judgment. It's going to just make them capable of coming out of the judgment. <laughs> when the judgment falls, the main thing is get through the thing. Amen. That's the main thing. Get through it. Mm -hmm. Some of us are persuaded that the United States is headed for some kind of uh -huh. epochal judgment. Yeah. We can't stop it. If that is true, we can't stop it from coming. But the main thing is get through it. Get Amen. through the thing. God will protect his people yeah. in the midst. He'll make a shelter in a time of storms. He'll protect the people. But for these people to be protected, judgment had to come down like waters. Righteousness had to break out like a stream. It had to break out right away and in big, copious quantities. Mm -hmm. Then you'll be able to survive. But I am going to send you into captivity. <laughs> When you think of what God did for these people, he heard them. When See, the bondage was hard. He had a hard bondage. Government taking murder in their children as soon as they were born. See, what did that happen today? We have several sisters that just had children. What if the government killed them? What would you do? How would you handle it? That's the kind of current circumstances they lived under. And some people decided they weren't going to do it. The midwife said, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. And when Pharaoh said, well, how come you didn't kill the male babies? Like I told you, I said, these Hebrew women, they're lively women. They give birth really quick, and we couldn't get there in time. Yeah. Hmm? So what did God do? He gave a big household for those midwives. Amen. Huh? Yeah. So you don't have to cave in. Amen. <laughs> Yes, he delivered them from Egypt. He drowned their enemies in the sea. He gave miraculous bread, water. He just think of all the things he did. And they uh, turned their back. Says, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna cause this. I'm gonna cause this." 
Yeah. Say, well, God can't force, God doesn't force things on you. I'm going to cause this. Yeah. No restriction to God. He causes things of his own choosing to take place, whether they're pleasant or not. Like he won't send something that'll hurt you if you've been walking before him as a dear child. I mean, God's not going to punish you for doing that. I'm going to send you far away into captivity, beyond Damascus. As I mentioned to you, Stephen said, beyond Babylon. What's the difference? Well, Babylon was a, a large, not the city of Babylon, the region of Babylon, or Babylonia, sometimes it's called, was a large region. Damascus was in the western part of it. And Assyria, where the ex Israel was exiled, they were in the northern. You see the map, they were in the northern part, far beyond Damascus. I'm going to send you way out there to that Nethan region way out there in Assyria. I'm going to send that, send you there. And this actually did happen. 2 Kings 17, 6 says, In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria, that's the capital of Israel, and took the uh, Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and Haber by the river Gozan and in the cities of the Medes. Scattered them way out there, away from the homeland. See, now these things are written so we don't get confused about circumstances. Israel's demise was not a historical phenomenon yeah. traceable to the collapse of their culture. Gibbon wrote a long series of books, The Decline and Fall of Rome, and he traced it to moral decline. That is not true. Rome came down by the kingdom of God. Yeah, amen. It was God that did that. That's why the God withdrew. That's why their morals sunk. See, it was a judgment. Yeah. Uh -huh. And if America falls, it's not going to be because it had a low moral standard. It has a low moral standard because it's forsaken God. Amen. And God's pulled out. And when he does, the bottom falls out and down they go. Yeah. That's why drugs, narcotics, fornication, all this kind of stuff, pornography, is on the increase is because God's not in the house. Amen. That's what that's all about. Yeah. And you, I urge you not to get caught up in it. I say that because Satan working overtime to yeah, right. make you part of it. <laughs> Now, the God of hosts is going to do this. Hosts means, means armies. God has armies. They're not armies of flesh and blood armies. They're angelic armies. I want to tell you why he uses armies versus himself just personally doing it. It says of God's person, this is far in, Psalm 97.3, a fire goeth out before him and burneth up his enemies round about. All right, here's God. God's moving along. There's this fire. Consumes everything. to make a difference what it is. It consumes everything. So if you're going to work with people, he himself can't come among them. It'll kill him if he does. So he's got this army. They all oh, they're powerful, but their presence doesn't consume. They can they can consume, but their presence doesn't consume. Yes, yes. So he has this army that actually allows for the race to be preserved. Yeah. If it wasn't for these hosts, <laughs> humanity would have been gone a long time ago. Amen. He's a God of hosts. So this host, here's what it says of them in Psalm 103:20. They excel in strength. They do his commandments, hearkening to the voice of his word. So they're immediate and precise in everything they do to God, good to do for God. Every commission he sends them on, they obey it. Can you see this? Yeah. That's what enables the preservers. And then now we have, of course, the ultimate 
God, of God working among men is the man Christ Jesus. Yeah. Amen. He's one of us, Amen. which allows God, and the fullness of the Godhead dwells in him bodily. So yeah. angels don't have the fullness in them. Yeah. Jesus has the fullness in him, but his humanity protects us yes. from being consumed yeah. by his deity. Yeah. Oh, this is good stuff. Can you see that? He is humanity. He's a glorified man. Yeah. He's not a man like you and I are men. Yeah, right. He's a glorified man, but that's what enables us to survive. Yes. Amen. Who but God could come up with? Yes. Amen. Who but God would come up with something like this? Yes. If like Nebuchadnezzar or Cyrus or one of these guys was appointed savior, they, they would have extinguished the race, see? Yes. Uh -huh. Not God. Yeah. So if you ever wonder... Does God really want to save me? Well, if he didn't, he wouldn't be using mighty hosts yes, amen. and the man Christ Jesus. The very fact that he uses these confirms to you God's serious about saving you. Amen. This is not some kind of a game with God. Yeah. Yeah. He has gone to extensive measures to ensure that you can survive his presence and even his judgment on earth by employing these angelic hosts in the man Christ Jesus. And so, yeah, we can't, uh, we can't guarantee that you won't be punished for your sins. I, mean, I was mine, and sometimes I still am. Things happen to me. I said, ah, I can remember something I did, yeah. I forgot about that, but now I remember it. Yes. I was just uh, 13 years old, but I'd had the experience of a 20-year-old when I was 13-year-old. And just for fun, I burned down a man's fruit stand. I can't begin to tell you how many times I've been reminded by some of my own possessions, losing them. God's kept that very lively in my mind. That happened a good number of years ago. See, this is the way God is, brethren. God won't forget your sin when it comes to dealing with you, he'll remit it. I understand that. I'll remember their sins no more. But it really is best, is best for us from time to time to have some reminders of how we conducted ourselves in the wilderness. Am I right? It'll stir up your pure mind and it'll make you say, I'm, gonna, I'm resolved, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to let righteousness erupt like a great flowing river. I'm going. I'm. I'm, I'm going to let judgment pour out like a flood. Yeah, that's what God wants. That's what God asks. All of the grace you need to do that will be supplied. When you put when you put your mind to do this, to be right in the way you look at things, to be correct in your judgments and in your assessments. You make up your mind, this is what I'm going to do. Then God will come alongside through the Holy Spirit. He'll come alongside and he'll enable you to actually carry that out. Yes, and you won't be wrong in your assessments and you won't bludgeon people. You know, you'll, you'll have the right motives. And then your own integrity and righteousness and uprightness will blossom. God will make it. You'll suddenly be able to associate everything you do with God. With even cooking and mowing the lawn, whatever it is, whatever you do, you will connect it with God. That's righteousness springing forth. Amen. Springing forth. Yes. Well, I, I think I'll close there, but I got so much out of this. Yes. Seeing the way God is and how he wants us to, he wants us to understand this. Yes. Uh -huh. Not so we'll run away from him. Yeah. That's not why. So we'll run to him. Okay. Yes, Sister Nikki. Yeah, when you're speaking about
about this, how the Lord is telling them what to do so that they can survive That's the right. judgment. You got it. I was reminded of, of the words of Jesus. When he was talking, he said, the, he was talking about the stone. Did you never read the, in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. And then he goes on to say, Whosoever shall fall on yeah. this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it, it will grind him to powder. Yeah. And so the, the Lord, Jesus, is our way of escape from this, the, the judgment that is going to come. We need to... We, we fall on him. Fall on the stone. Otherwise, man. you'll be ground right. into powder. You'll be irrecoverable. Mm -hmm. Amen. Everybody oh. can see that, kids. Sure. It's a it's a marvelous thing to see, and it it's it's doable. This this is doable. What we're talking about here. There's grace, in other words. By doable, I mean there's grace to do it. It's about. You made the comment that the recovery can be quick, but not easy. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's an opportunity from the Lord. For those who have turned away from sin to exert themselves more for the Lord than they had for the sin they were previously engaged in. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Yes, Lorraine. Yeah. These idols that the, the Lord mentions, I thought that a lot of a lot of times today, idols in people's minds are 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 just like associated with mystical cultures and uh -huh. or ancient practices or uh, something of a of an actual image. An idol is anything that is worshipped above God, so uh -huh. it can take many forms, and and there obviously are a lot of a valid immediate associations that people make in their minds with idols, because people in ancient times, not only ancient, but they would worship like this, this, this uh, god of the sun, or the god of a of a planet, or stars, something of, <coughs> of cosmic nature, or something greater than than themselves. Mm -hmm. It seems today, though, that uh, humanity has has descended to such depths that they've made idols of men mm -hmm. and even idols of themselves. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the scripture even mentions the Lord identified some specific evidences of sin in people. He said, "You you thought that I was altogether like you." Uh -huh. <laughs> That's a That's form right. of idolatry. Uh -huh. And like the flip side of that is in expression of the wicked in the Psalms was that um, who is Lord over us? Uh -huh. Our lips are our own. Uh -huh. And so what sin actually did was reverse the role of God and man. Uh -huh. yeah. They thought that they thought of God as a man uh -huh. and they thought of themselves as a God. This you mentioned it in your in your lesson about the about music and you yeah. know this is this is such a part of 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 the what God's put in man. We we, we can worship God through music. Mm -hmm. God accepts that when we sing mm -hmm. praise to Him. So see, Satan has corrupted this, and 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 there's actually demons involved. You can't you can't look at the modern music and not realize that these things are being controlled by demons. I mean, you just look, go to the iTunes, so I don't recommend this, but and just look around, and it is filled with demonic expressions. Why? Because he, he yeah. can control people through their yeah. love for music. Yeah. I mean, they, they express, well, anyway, um, but see, this can also be a valid form of worship. You can actually get closer to God or, or, or be able to express yourself in a way that's pleasing to God through Music. Oh, yes. Amen. So see, this is you can. See, I can see why Satan has, has capitalized on this yeah. in our generation. You know, because you can take a person's heart away through this simple little melody in their head, and before long, they're not thinking about God at all. They're thinking about some silly yeah. thing over here, and yet, anyway. Yeah, I, I thought that there are some quote worship services, whatever that is. There's nothing mentioned right in the Bible. That are actually offerings to the God of music. Yes, right. People bring that bring the music that they enjoyed in the world, and they bring it, switch a few of the words around. But the uh, the music itself is an idol, and churches are split. Churches split over what kind of music. Yeah. yeah. I was considering when you talked about. Um, when you were talking earlier, I was reminded of Brother Jonathan Edwards. He had meant, he had um, talked about how 
um, it's I, when, we're, when we're saved, it's like, well, anybody, really, God is holding them with his hand, and he can easily pull that out, mm -hmm. and they can fall straight. That's right. And That's so, right. Um, show, when, earlier you said showing God your back is refusing, refusing to face him. Well, um, God is just in all he does, so he could just pull out. He could just pull out because you turned your back on him, and so it would be just mm. for him to pull out, and I was thankful. Yeah, and when he said that yeah. he he left them, that's that's what he did. That's right. yeah. Took away the support, in other words. Yeah. 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 Anybody else tonight? All right, let's have a word of prayer. <coughs> Our dear Heavenly Father, we we thank you for the revelation of yourself. We confess, Lord, that we we want to walk as dear children. We want to please you. We don't want anything that you dislike or not do not favor to be found in us. Mm -hmm. And we know that we we need your help in this. And we are not ashamed to ask for it. Give us grace. Cause us to walk in your steps. And we know that we will experience a great satisfaction that cannot be had any other way. We offer ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>